Hello and welcome to this week's caregiver question of the week. This week we have a really important question about safety with swallowing. And so naturally I brought on a fabulous speech therapist, the wonderful Rebecca Wellner to help me with this question because it's one of those things that it is like too important to not have really great information about. Question was, is it not okay to just add thicket or like liquid thickener to someone's, you know, water or beverage if they seem to be having trouble swallowing? So big question. We're going to get into it here. First, my name is Amelia. I'm an occupational therapist. I'm the owner and founder of Higher Standards Caregiver Training, as well as the very proud co-founder of WCN University. That's Whole Care Network University. And by the way, Whole Care Network is about to do something pretty cool coming up here shortly, um, or maybe it's already happened, depending on when you're actually watching this caregiver question of the week. We are about to launch streaming radio. Yes, the Whole Care Network streaming radio app. So check out wholecarenetwork.com um, to find out more about that. Whole Care Network is a great resource site for family caregivers. Also, I promise I will let Rebecca talk here in a second. Keep in mind, this is for educational purposes only. It's not a substitute for help or medical advice, and it's not a substitute for a therapeutic relationship. So if you need those things, make sure you go to your individual healthcare provider or the healthcare provider of the person that you care for. Okay, Rebecca, take it away. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. So I'm Rebecca. I'm a speech pathologist, like Amelia said. Um, I get this question constantly. And in fact, often I, I, so I work in home health right now, and often I walk into someone's home and there are thickened liquids around, maybe powder thickener, maybe liquid thickener um, that they're using because someone recommended it because someone else knew someone who had trouble swallowing and they were recommended thickened liquids. And I totally understand why people gravitate towards this recommendation. It kind of feels like an obvious quick fix. Unfortunately, it's actually quite dangerous. So basically the way that thickened liquids work is that I mean, it, you can think about it logically. It slows the liquid as it's going down. And this is great for a really specific subset of people who have dysphagia or difficulty swallowing, but it is not appropriate for, I would say, the majority of people who have difficulty swallowing. So you can think about it this way. So for example, if someone has a lot of if the problem that someone is having with their swallow is that they have a lot of residue sitting in their throat, something going down more slowly is just gonna, it's just gonna make that problem worse. Um, so the only way, the only way to know if thickened liquids are appropriate for someone and to know the specific amount of thickened or the specific consistency rather of the thickened liquid, the only way to know that is to have an instrumental assessment of the swallow conducted. And this is either an x-ray that's taken while someone is eating and drinking um, or a scope where it goes you know, up the nose, down the throat to look at the swallow that way. And um, unfortunately, what people will say is, well, I gave her thickened liquids and now she's not coughing anymore. So like, we're all good. But unfortunately, not coughing doesn't mean that things aren't going down the wrong way. Coughing is actually a protective response that we have, right? So like if I start drinking my water, I'm going too fast, I'm not paying attention, and it's a little bit starts to go down the wrong way, I'm going to cough. I'm relatively healthy. I have a nice strong cough. I'm going to eject that from my airway and I'm going to be fine, go about my day. Even if a little bit does get into my lungs, it's just not going to be the end of the world for me personally. But in a setting of someone who is, other, is at risk, they meet a lot of different risk factors for developing an infection related to liquids going down the wrong way, aspiration pneumonia, um, it can be really dangerous. And so it's, and it's also scary when someone's coughing a lot during meals. And so it's absolutely the correct response to do something, but thickening liquids is not that thing. Asking your doctor for a referral to a speech therapist is gonna be the first step. Um, if something does go down the wrong way and someone's not coughing, so if they stop coughing, so if they're not coughing anymore, when you give them those thickened liquids, they could be silently aspirating. And this means that the liquids are actually going down the wrong way, but they're not having that cough response. You do not know that that is happening or not 
because you don't have x-ray vision. Um, and I wouldn't know at bedside. So even if a speech therapist were to come and visit and not do an instrumental assessment, we also don't know. Um, Cause again, we don't have x-ray vision, unfortunately. Um, so that's sort of the shortest version of my answer to that question. That was actually like a really wonderful, thorough answer to that question. And I kind of just want to go and just like review just a little bit. So basically there can be, there are different kinds of dysphagia or swallowing problems that people can have. And we can't tell what they are just from listening to the symptoms that someone might have. So someone might cough or they might have like a wet or gurgly voice um, or they might clear their throat a lot or they might have no symptoms at all. Maybe they get pneumonia all the time or something like that. Um, but we can't tell from those potential red flags what the actual problem is. We really need to have a professional do that specific type of evaluation where you can see inside and you can see what that swallow is looking like. Is that correct? Absolutely. And I'll add, you know, you mentioned pneumonia. So someone who's getting, who has recurrent episodes specifically of aspiration pneumonia, um, it's really important to look at why that's happening. So just dysphagia, just difficulty swallowing by itself doesn't necessarily put a person at risk for, well, it puts a person at risk for aspiration pneumonia, but there are a lot of other risk factors that together result in someone developing aspiration pneumonia. So actually, if you are looking for sort of like a quick fix, this doesn't actually fix anything, but um, well, I guess it does, it does, it decreases the risk of developing aspiration pneumonia. Um, something you can do is make sure that their oral care is really good. So if things are going to be going down the wrong way, um, we want to make sure that bacteria from the mouth isn't also going down the wrong way with it. Um, so oral care is something that you can definitely get on top of that can really help a lot um, in terms of thinking of ways to mitigate the risk of developing aspiration pneumonia. Uh, I love that you mentioned that because I think oral care is something that can like fall by the wayside for folks, especially if someone is maybe resistant to having oral care done or a lot of times just if people don't, maybe their dentition is poor, maybe they don't have a lot of teeth remaining, then maybe oral care can fall by the wayside. But even when people, even when people have no teeth at all, actually, we still want to make sure that their mouth is getting clean, right? Because that helps to prevent the bacteria from building up for all kinds of reasons, but it helps to make sure that if that person does accidentally aspirate, you know, there's not a bunch of funky stuff going down there, basically. Exactly. And people have a lot of trouble performing oral care for a lot of reasons. It's very valid. It can be extremely difficult, um, especially in later stages of dementia, but they're like in a lot of conditions, in any condition. Um, and also people get a lot of mixed information from people. So maybe they've been told to use swabs to do oral care. And in really, really specific rare situations, um, that may be the most appropriate. But um, almost always using a toothbrush and toothpaste is really important. And um, you can definitely talk to an occupational therapist can help. And you can talk about how you, you can help if someone's having certain types of difficulty. Speech therapist can help if your concern is aspiration, um, things going down the wrong way. And a dentist can help as well, um, just in terms of problem solving. Um, so yeah, if you want to speak to how, how occupational therapists can be really helpful in the well, process. Yeah, no, like you said, I mean, there are so many reasons why people might not, um, either want to brush their teeth or it might be difficult for them or their care partner to assist with brushing their teeth. And really, you know, every situation is different. And one of the things that occupational therapists specialize in, of course, is where we help people do the things that they need or want to do and oral care. Um, is a basic activity of daily living that's high on that list. We work with those kinds of issues all the time. So I think the really big takeaway um, beyond the like exceptional level of information that you just provided, I mean, like really, thank you. That was great. Um, besides that, I, I think what I really want folks to take away from this is if you think there's a problem, reach out to your medical provider about that. And I know that that's maybe not like the easiest answer. It's not the answer that we all want, you know, call the doctor and get help. But the fact is that there are some things that we really just need the doctor and the rest of the healthcare team to be involved in, in order to make sure that it's being addressed appropriately. 
as opposed to maybe taking advice from people who are really well-meaning, maybe who have been in similar situations, um, uh, but, you know, just don't have a way to really understand what's actually going on in there. So reaching out to those experts, let them use the tools at their disposal to do ultimately what everyone's goal is, which is keep everyone in that situation healthy and safe and living a high quality of life for as long as possible. Exactly. And I think it's worth, you know, taking into account that swallowing is sort of this thing we all take for granted. And so it's easy to just assume like, oh, like, we'll just figure it out. Like they've been swallowing forever. They'll, you know, but um, swallowing involves more than 30 different pairs of muscles. It's actually quite complex. You know, I don't really know how like legs work and I would never trust myself to reteach myself how to walk if I was having trouble with that, for example. It's maybe a bit of a stretch, but but I'm just saying swallowing is a lot more complicated than people realize. And the other problem, of course, is that we're called speech therapists or speech language pathologists. And so people don't even realize that we exist to help with this, but I promise we do. So, yeah. So, and again, thank you for being here on Caregiver Question of the Week. I think it's so important to highlight this very, very important safety and quality of life, life issue, but also... As you know, it's really important to me to highlight other professions in the healthcare field that are a lot of times under-recognized, under-utilized, undervalued, and speech therapy is absolutely one of those. I love working with speech therapists. It's like, back in the day, that was my, back in the day, I loved just go co-treating with my speech therapist. <laughs> It was, it was awesome. Um, I so the same they, way occupational therapists, of course, you know, we're like, we're like peas and carrots. We are, That's we're right. like peas and carrots. We just go together. Um, <laughs> but like thank I you so much. Oh, no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I realized I might've forgotten to say something that's really important. Um, go so for just, it. Go for it. Sorry. Just to go back. I wanted to talk about just quickly the reasons that thickened liquids can be dangerous because I feel like I didn't mention that beyond just the fact that they could actually be aspirated and some people actually have a higher chance of aspirating them. Um, first of all, if they are aspirated, thickened liquids are also worse because they're thicker. Um, so that's, that's less good for you. And we do have studies that show that. Um, also, studies show that they can lead to dehydration, UTIs, and decreased quality of life. So this is really, really important. And they're not so fun to drink. So, you know, I would recommend if it's something that your, your person, someone that you're care partnering with um, has to deal with, if, they, if a professional has recommended it and it's really important, then of course you should stick to that recommendation. Um, but I don't know, try them. They're not, they're not that pleasant. There are ways that they can be made more pleasant if someone needs them, but there are just so many risks if someone does not. And I know that it's not people's intention to put people at higher risk, but unfortunately that is the reality with thickened liquids. Uh, sorry, now I'm gonna mention one more thing and then I promise we'll wrap it up folks. Um, <laughs> but, but the other thing I think that's worth mentioning about aspiration is it's not just something that can happen with liquids. It can happen with different textures of food and things as well. So it's not just that we're thinking about the beverages that someone is swallowing when the speech therapist is looking at aspiration or what kind of swallowing problems someone might have. You're also looking at food consistency and texture and things like that too. So it really just, you know, thickening liquids is certainly, as you have said, it's not obviously always, it's, it's gotta be something that's recommended is the very specific right suggestion for that person, but it's also not a panacea, you know, for solving all potential problems with aspiration. Right, um, and there are a lot okay. of things, you can aspirate on your saliva, you can aspirate if you have just a feeding tube and you aren't eating anything by mouth, so yeah. We could probably talk about <laughs> aspiration for, for, for forever. I'm done, I'm um, done. No, no, that's cool. I mean, honestly, really and truly, this is such an, an this is really such an important topic. I can't tell you how many times I've walked into homes or patient rooms or something like that and seen an issue that needed to be immediately addressed that had that was related to, um, you know, swallowing or or feeding safety or something like that. So it really and and it's also like often there's just not that much good information out there about it. So that's why it's so important, I think, to address these kinds of questions in 
as comprehensive a way as we possibly can and, and really give people great information. So, um, so again, thank you for being here to do that uh, with me today, Rebecca. Um, if y'all are wondering, Rebecca has a course on WCN University about um, caring for folks with dementia. It's pretty awesome. And as you can see, Rebecca herself is pretty bomb. So <laughs> definitely go and check that out. Um, anything else you want to add today before we wrap up, Rebecca? I'm done. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for watching or listening to this week's caregiver question of the week. Until next time, please stay healthy, stay well, and most of all, take care. Bye.